long so hours ago so uh let me let me share the screen right now all right and then we'll get ready to start it all right so Chinese, that's a love music. coming today. Wow, I cannot believe this. Uh, welcome our first guest today, Lucky from Malaysia. And all of you, you are all important to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Put them a little bit and then, okay, I can talk. Thank you. I was, uh, you know, temporary stop by in Taiwan. And you all in the all the upset that direction from me, maybe. And between us, that's time and air. So we I was so surprised. If Joe, what kind of show? Joe will use uh, this uh, magical moment to let us uh, how to when we use the storytelling, how to use the time, how to use the, our space here. Okay. So right now I will let my bonbon thing to see. Can you explain the what's mean bonbon? Lucy, are you here? Yes, I am. And um, the first of first of all, when I saw when I heard about bonbon, and uh, because I took French before, so I, I was not thinking about everything's about good. Everything is good. And uh, you know, so I mean, no matter what the people there and the, what the performance and the, what the, about all the thoughts behind it and everything is good. Yes, uh, bonbon. Yeah, also, of course, our bonbon audience is great. Yeah, bonbon means the sweet candy in French, and also means um, uh, when we in Chinese we say pong pong hao peng you, like uh, you make a good friend, or bonbon you bouncing your life story. So that's yeah. bon bon mean. And now before we start it, Eva, use your nicely way, tell us how uh, the simple rule today. Eva, I'm you. All right. Yes, uh, we are so honored to have Zhang here today in this Zoom meeting. I would like to uh, remind you some of the basic uh, virtual meeting protocol today. Uh, Zhang uh, said he's going to have a, a kind of a relaxed and easygoing uh, the way of storytelling. Uh, they will allow some, some interaction uh, during the entire talk show. 
So even though uh, our host uh, will, work, will be minimizing uh, all uh, any interruption from the back background, I believe that she will, the host will mute all the microphone throughout the, um, throughout the whole time, but only when John is asking the audience, audiences to get involved to, to, to interact with him at the time, um, I believe uh, anyone can turn turn on your microphone to uh, to get uh, to interact with Zhang. There's a chat box we would encourage everyone to use. You are welcome to write down any comments as feedback to Zhang, and I believe Zhang would love to read it afterwards. Uh, or in a Q and A session, we will be presenting to Zhang, and also. You can address your question in the chat box too. Uh, there's a Q&A session afterward. All the questions will be, will be presented one by one for John to answer. For those uh, audiences in, in Taiwan, if you don't feel comfortable to ask a question in English, you can also write in Chinese and we will help to translate, uh, translate for you uh, during the Q&A session. Mm. I think this concludes my reminders as, uh, for for the virtual virtual meeting protocol. Now I would I would like to hand the mic to uh, to you, uh, Shine uh, or to Shane. Yes, yes, yes. Thank okay. you. I would like to hand the mic to Shane. I know we have many friends uh, in the Facebook, and then uh, thank you. Hi, Facebook friend. Thank you for watching us. Uh, oh, oh no! Wow. John, why you make me disappear? Why? Huh? Wow. You are magical. Let's <laughs> <laughs> oh, welcome yeah. John Dai from his parents was from Taiwan. We are so proud of Taiwan young generation to move forward to the international show. John and Shen, that's your show now. Welcome you. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Um, I think I recognize a good number of people here, uh, but I know there's also a good number that maybe we're meeting for the first time. So Shane has been so kind as to uh, prepare a, a short introduction just to kind of get a baseline of uh, who I am and what I do, and then uh, and then I can take it from there. So, uh, yeah. Well, I have to be totally honest about this. Um, so I didn't prepare, <laughs> but <laughs> I wanted to thank Shiny for inviting me. My name is Shane Larango, and I'm um, friends with Shiny in Dallas from the Dallas Storytelling Guild and the Tejas Storytelling Association. And it is just such a delight to be around her. And it's so wonderful to see such an international audience. And I am super excited to introduce John Tai tonight. He is a celebrated mu um, magician. I want to make sure I didn't say musician. Happens um, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like you're, you're like. <laughs> so he is a celebrated magician and storyteller whose mission is to foster connections between people through shared moments of astonishment. He performs magic across the country and around the world, in person and virtually. He has called the, the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust's Liberty Magic Theater his home base since its grand opening in early 2019. He is best known for having co-created and starred in Missed Connections off-Broadway at the 59E59 Theaters in New York City. Following its premiere at the Chicago's MacArthur Award-winning A Red Orchid Theater, and most recently for having co-created and starred in Road Signs, an in-person play with magic that premiered in Pittsburgh. John is a 10-year veteran of the medical software industry and is proud to support several health and human services nonprofit organizations through his magic, including Hello Neighbor, the Cancer Caring Center, Beverly's Birthday, and Pace Schools. A graduate of Cornell University with a degree in psychology, he lives with his wife Kate and tiny dog Nina 
in the Troy Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, right around the corner from his favorite coffee shop and cafe, The Pear and the Pickle. Maybe if you show up and recognize him, he'll buy you a latte. <laughs> John. Deal. <laughs> so much. Cool. Uh, Shiny, Shane, Ava, thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight myself for everyone. Uh, and if you're not already, I recommend clicking on view in your upper right hand corner and then click on full screen to be able to see this uh, nice and big. Um, so uh, my name's John Tai, as you've heard, and I am a professional magician and storyteller. Uh, I realize that the word magician can tend to conjure up images of sequins and tight leather pants and top hats and rabbits and all that jazz. Uh, and all of that is very much not in my vibe and aesthetic. So I figure a good way for us to start uh, might be for me to tell you a little bit about my particular style and my work so that you can have that context for all that we're going to be talking about from here on out. And the best way I can probably put it is actually in the words of my very good friend and creative and business partner, Alex Gruen. Uh, on one of our many, many, many conversations together, uh, he once described me as a, uh, as a social magician. And I thought that was such a great way of putting it because more than, the method, more than the methods or techniques or even the tricks themselves, you know, for me, the focus is very much on the human element, how we share moments as human beings in as grounded and as real and as authentic of a way as we can. And true to that form, one of the first places that I first started sharing magic regularly was that coffee shop cafe down the street from where I live, a place very near and dear to my heart called The Pear and the Pickle. And on occasion, uh, I would walk down there with this sign and this easel. Uh, actually, the one that you see behind me here that says magic, mind reading, and mystery on demand uh, and I would just get a cup of coffee, sit at a large communal table with a mug in hand, and I would share a bit of magic and mystery with anyone curious enough to say hello. And, you know, there were plenty of times someone would walk in, see me with my sign, get one of those questioning looks on their face, and just walk away. And I'm sure some had to run or maybe didn't have the time, but, you know, I wonder for yeah, how yeah. many... It was just oh, that there. Oh, we're getting a little. We're getting a little feedback. If someone can mute themselves, uh, but you know, I wonder for how many it was just that they, their curiosity, you know, wasn't quite enough to overcome all of the things built up in us over the years that stop us from saying hello to a random stranger. So look, I know we're not actually in a coffee shop right now. Uh, I don't even have a cup of coffee; just a small jar of water. But you know, tonight or this morning, wherever you are, you know, all of you in your own ways have been curious and, and brave enough to say hello. And so I want to begin by sharing one of my favorite things with you right now. Uh, it's this guessing game where I have this. And I don't know if you all can make that out, but here, I'll try to bring it closer to my camera so you can see, um, oh, my camera's definitely reversed. Oh God. This just isn't gonna work, is it? <laughs> Here, tell you what, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, it's something that's round. Uh, it is something that is quite shiny, uh, especially when held in the right light. And it is something that is just a little heavier than a quarter. On the count of three, I'd like everyone to unmute themselves and yell out a guess. Ready? One, two, three. Diamond. <laughs> 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 well, the only guess I heard was diamond, and I wish it was, but what I actually have is uh, a half dollar. So this is one of my favorite things to share, you know, especially with someone who I've just met, because it's something that leads a person to make a choice where, you know, uh, Shane, you can look at me and you can roll your eyes and go, look, I know there's nothing there. This is silly. You get a real job. Or, or even knowing full well there's nothing there, you can choose to have a little fun, to play a little pretend. And so again, I know you're not actually sat across from me right now, but you know, if this coin can be real, why not my water a cup of coffee? And 
why can't we allow ourselves to escape into another world, even if it's just for this time that we have together? So this is actually one of the opening pieces to our play with magic, Misconnections, that Alex and I co-created specifically for the virtual world over the heart of the pandemic. It's an invitation for folks to step into my home, to enter into another world and to start to forget all of the assumed limitations of having to be together virtually. You know, when I began exploring creating work in this medium, I first started thinking about what tools unique to this world could be used to create an effect. But that was just the most basic level, you know, more important than the methods or even the tricks themselves are, again, the human aspects. How can we communicate and interact over Zoom? Is the way that we normally use video chat actually the most effective way to create meaningful human connection? Or is there opportunity to step back and, and rethink how these tools can be used? And beyond the in the moment experience of a virtual work, what are the business models that this medium might allow for that previously haven't existed? You know, what does it mean to suddenly be able to partner with organizations regardless of physical distance and location and to have a potential audience base that literally spans the globe? You know, over the last few years, these are the questions that I've been exploring with my partner, Alex Gruen. And over the next hour, I'm going to discuss these questions and some of our answers, as well as what's happened in our journey following this project. But before we get there, I want to talk about a few of the lessons that I've learned from my time as a full-time artist, virtual and in-person, and moreover, from my preceding career in which I worked for almost a decade before taking the leap to do what I'm doing today. All right, let's get into it. Lesson number one. It's not all rainbows and butterflies. There is a mantra that has been prevalent in my generation of uh, do what you love. You know, on one hand, I find that to be a beautiful sentiment and a testament to the privilege and good fortune I've had to be born in this time and place to exist in a world where me and many of my peers have the luxury to strive to walk to the beat of our own drum, so to speak. But I've come to be of the mind that that mantra is often uh, taken in an oversimplified way. And at least for me, it ended up becoming this uh, obstacle that I've had to work through and bring nuance to over the years. But it's all part of the process of living, isn't it? I mean, we all wish we could have the wisdom of today in our yesteryears, but we can't and I didn't. And when I was a, a far more naive kid as a sophomore in college, I put on my very first full length theatrical magic show in a little black box theater at Cornell. Uh, it was a single weekend run of just three performances. Uh, opening night was a total and complete mess. <laughs> Uh, the kind of self-perceived failure that makes you want to crawl into a hole and vanish from the world. Uh, but then between that performance and the next, you know, there was nothing to do but do all we could to work out the kinks. And the next show rolls around and it ends up being an absolute triumph. Uh, granted, looking back at the footage from that show today makes me cringe. But for John Tai at that time, it was a euphoric, uh, smashing success. And and it was the first time that I seriously considered the possibility that maybe I could really do this for a living. Do what you love echoes in my mind for the next three years. And when I graduate from college, that's exactly what I do. I tell myself and everyone around me that I'm going to work towards becoming a professional magician. At that time, I actually also had one foot in the business professional world and had been working part-time for a software company. The entire company was completely remote, uh, you know, before it was cool. And I had started working there as a technical support agent to make some extra income until I graduated and figured out what I really wanted to do. 
you know, upon graduating, the idea was that I would uh, work on growing the magic business until it was financially sustainable enough for me to leave the software company and make performance my full-time profession. You know, very reasonable and logical plan. The problem was that I was far more enamored with the idea of being a professional magician than with the practical realities of it. And as I got gigs and performed more and grew the business, I, I started losing a core joy in the process of it. I, I became increasingly paralyzed by this final destination image I had of professional artist. You know, all the while I'm still working at the software company and, and just spinning my wheels there, you know, going through the motions as I pursue doing what I love. In the midst of this period of figuring out that I didn't really have things figured out, I, I feel this urge to, uh, to escape, to vanish. And I leave on a quintessential soul-searching American road trip. I continue working at the software company as I travel, and I, I end up being on the road for almost eight months. Halfway through the journey, uh, I'm driving into uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, near where Shane is. Uh, it's late at night, and and I am hit with something like a like a panic attack. Like I nearly crash the car. I managed to pull over, and for the first time, I, I consciously consider a question I've been avoiding. Is magic really one of what, what I want to do with my life? And the far more terrifying follow-up question of, if not magic, then what? I don't know, but at that point, I stopped doing magic entirely, and I feel free. Uh, over the rest of my journey, I do come back to sharing a little magic here and there, but it very much falls into the, the peripheries of my life. I will end up working at that software company for nearly a decade, going from technical support agent to director of support to director of operations, a, a near decade before taking the leap to revisiting being a full-time artist. As a society, we, we glorify working in the arts. You know, it's hard not to. And I don't want to take away from the very real courage it takes to do so, you know, nor the admiration I have for those who do. Yeah, anyone who chooses to walk this path is deserving of that admiration. But the first lesson I want to share, the thing that I didn't internalize until that decade later, is that just like working at a software company or as any other business professional, working as an artist is a job. It's not a, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. And that mantra of do what you love tends to gloss over that reality. You know, I remember telling someone once that uh, I am a professional magician and them saying back to me, ah, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And quite frankly, that is total nonsense. And whenever I hear someone say that cliche, I always think of another saying I once heard, a saying that I find far more true and far more useful. There is shoveling cow poop no matter what you do. At first look, that might seem like a depressing truth, but I don't know, if anything, I, I think it's the opposite. Yeah, I think it's fantastically freeing. To, to be able to sit firmly in the knowledge that, that doing what you love is as earthbound as any other profession, that there is nothing inherently better or more worthwhile between pursuing a career in the arts versus a career outside of that world. It, it's simply a choice. And either choice has its own share of cow poop to shovel and it, its own potentials for, for triumph and, and joy and, and fulfillment. And if anyone does make that choice to go after doing what you love, yeah, what a what a comfort it is to know that there is nothing abnormal about having doubts, right? About the road being rough and winding, that that we are not alone in our trials and tribulations. And that even more than those who have not made a conscious choice one way or the other, 
that we or anyone doing what we love are working every day of our lives. But what a joy it is to work because we choose to. All right, let's move on to lesson number two. How to deal with a once in a lifetime global catastrophe that completely shuts down your entire industry overnight. Don't try to wait out the storm. Leap into the unknown. The thesis of our show, uh, Misconnections, is that if you take a leap, the universe might yield the most beautiful magic trick of all, eternal connection. But it's something that's core to more than just the show. It's an idea that we live by during this time period. Yeah, I took the leap to create a piece of work for the virtual world, a world that I had many, many misgivings about before diving in, and then took the leap to send out a series of cold emails to theaters around the country, just seeing if they would give me the time of day. And look what those leaps yielded. Uh, relationships with uh, Kirsten and Abby, respectively the artistic director and managing director of a Red Orchid Theater in Chicago, uh, a month-long run of shows there where I ended up getting to perform for and connect with people from all over the world, including uh, Emily Gillette, the wife of Penn Gillette of Penn & Teller, who are two of my magic heroes, uh, Adam Shire, the creator of Siri and a co-founder of Change.org, who also happens to be a magic fanatic, a graduate class at Northwestern Medill, and the list goes on. Uh, following that run of shows, we entered into a partnership with an off-Broadway theater in New York City called uh, 59E59, who then co-presented Misconnections for an additional run. Uh, I'll talk about this in more detail in a bit, but the way we went about it led to further relationships with um, Wesley Stace, a musician and author and all around polymath based out of Philadelphia, as well as Gregory Colstall and Mike Schroeder, the co-owners of Oddly Correct Coffee Company in Kansas City. And then there's us, uh, you and me here right now. And all of this was possible, you know, not in spite of, but because of the pandemic. There is a discomforting tension in recognizing that times of massive upheaval tend to also be times of great opportunity, that the word disruption cuts very hard in both directions, bad and good. And the sheer scale and the universality of the pandemic created an environment where a theater organizations like a Red Orchid, who almost certainly normally wouldn't give some random magician the time of day, might actually be open to taking a leap themselves into new territory. And before even getting to that threshold of willingness, uh, with an in-person operating model to have any possibility at all of partnering would have required physical proximity. But suddenly, the limits of geography cease to exist. You know, we had the potential to connect and work with anyone in the country and across the globe. And, and we tried to. We entered into talks with uh, Portland Center Stage in Oregon, with uh, Alliance Theater in Atlanta, uh, Flying V in DC, with the Fringe Festival in Dublin and Theater Absolute in Coventry. Uh, there are a hundred threads that we sent out to a hundred places, each of which had just as much practical potential of working out as a Red Orchid Theater. So, I take my series of leaps and Kirsten at a Red Orchid responds in kind. Now all we need is a good show. Uh, you know, let me ask you all something. What are all the downsides you can think of to sharing magic and theater in general, virtually rather than in person? Uh, please feel free to unmute and just shout out. So people can ask you a question in the meetup? Yeah, exactly. Like there's a possibility for interruption, right? And also because we're all kind of talking to our own microphones, uh, we all kind of can talk over each other and that can be a difficulty. Yeah, what else? What else can you think of? Not having um, the energy of the audience 
in your field of performance? That's a really good one. That's a really good observation, Shane, right? And I'm sure you it might experience this if you've done any virtual storytelling where, you know, in an effort to solve the first problem, we mute everyone, but then as we're talking, it becomes this one-way street, right? There's no feedback. There's none of that immediacy of, of having a conversation, right? Um, what else? What else? Anyone have any other ones? I Don't do. Be shy. Yeah, uh, what you got? Well, if it's virtual, some people may think that it's really a camera trick or something like that instead of actual performance with magic or something yeah totally uh that is a very practical you know technical issue that as a magician you very much have to deal with in this medium right part of the power of magic in person is that you have the freedom to shift your gaze wherever you'd like right and you have the freedom and the ability to physically handle props and examine things but here i have complete control over your frame of view Right. And so how do I contend with your knowledge that I could potentially be hiding things like outside the frame? Right. Yeah. Uh, which I certainly could be. Yeah, absolutely. Any, <laughs> any others? Cool. Uh, those were good. That was a really good list. Um, there is a couple other things, too, which uh, might not be as immediately apparent, which is and it's related to the first ones that we brought up in terms of people talking over each other. And then also, especially what Shane brought up of not having that audio feedback there, there's a space, there's this distance, right? When we are in person, when we can see each other, when we can literally touch each other, there is a very easy way to create a sense of intimacy, right? And to, and to kind of uh, create a sense of closeness, physical and, and emotional in that way, right? But here you have me talking to a camera, talking to a microphone, going through the internet, coming out through your computer into your own environment, right? There's all these kind of layers and barriers to creating a meaningful connection, right? And so how do we, how do we overcome those? And how do we potentially create, uh, create a sense of intimacy in this world that can feel so disconnected, right? Uh, now, let me ask you this. What are the benefits of sharing magic and theater in general, virtually? Can, can anyone think of any? Not catching infectious diseases. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> absolutely. COVID has not found a way to travel over Zoom. Thank God. <laughs> what else y'all got? It brings the price and magic power. Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, it's funny you bring up surprise. It's like surprise is very integral to magic too. And I think what's interesting about being in a new medium, like with all of us being forced kind of into a virtual world where we're all suddenly figuring it out as we go along is there's a lot of capacity for surprise, a lot of capacity for discovering and breaking rules and using these tools in ways that we hadn't used before, right? And so that can definitely be a thing. I think you use um, to, to do the the punchline is very hard it, because it needs to be very simple, very quickly. It's not like a speech. We can use our emotional or word to build up the, the level. How you use your punchline? One, two, three, and then people will wow. What's yeah, you know, you're, three, you're three, touching on a really good yeah, you're touching on a really good point too. That would be in the in the cons column, right? Which is uh, how do you maintain attention? Right? Because in magic, oftentimes, we're trying to get to the climax of an effect to, quote unquote, retain attention, right? But I think that's, I actually think that's the wrong way to approach magic. And that can be more limiting than helpful, right? I think we, I think we maintain attention through true human connection. And the trick is secondary to that, right? But on Zoom, you know, you could be surfing Google right now, for all I know, or looking on Facebook or whatever, right? I have no control over your environment or what you're doing, right? And so that's definitely a that's definitely a difficulty. Um, one more one more call out. Uh, can anyone think of any other benefits to presenting magic or theater over Zoom? One of the things that I love is that um, that we have that, and as a performers have an opportunity to to um, have greater audiences or, or larger audiences, but also as to, to as an audience member to get to watch more things and see more things that are going yeah. on. 
that's huge, right? Practically, geographically, logistically, and commercially, that's huge, right? Having an audience that can literally tune in from anywhere in the world. And we as performers can be anywhere in the world as well, right? Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are a couple other things that I found to be surprising benefits. And one is actually kind of the flip side of the coin of the con, which is intimacy, right? There is something actually really, there is an innate intimacy about being on Zoom when you turn on your camera and when you unmute yourselves, right? Because we are immediately thrust into each other's homes. And there's something very equalizing and egalitarian about being on Zoom where, yeah, I can spotlight myself, but in general, all our screens are the same size and we're all just kind of sharing in this weird thing together, right? So being forced to connect virtually, you know, open up this host of tools and benefits that only exist in the virtual world that could not be replicated in person. You know, we all found ourselves in a new sandbox where we had the freedom to create new rules and methods of interacting and experience building. And yet the majority of what we saw in the performance industry were theaters, streaming, archival footage of shows that were meant to be experienced in person, right? Or people taking what they did in person and just trying to put it in front of a camera where even though you could say things were technically happening live, you as the audience might as well just be watching Netflix. You know, there, was, there was a lack of acknowledgement of the medium of the fact that viewing things through a screen does change things and a lack of examination of the medium's existing norms and if they still made sense given the new and uncharted contexts in which we started using it. Here, I wanna, I wanna try something really quick just for five, 10 seconds. And what I would like to do is I'd like all of us to commit a little bit of video chat taboo together. And so in a moment, I'm actually going to ask you all to unmute yourselves and then to just stay unmuted for a good five, 10 seconds. And I want us to just listen. So uh, will you all join me in unmuting yourselves now? So everyone unmute. Yeah. Done. And we'll, and we'll just hang out for a little bit. You hear this okay. See? <laughs> <laughs> so you can uh, you can stay unmuted for now. Again, the host or myself, we might mute you if you get some background noise or feedback. But I want to ask you all a question. What did you hear during those 10 seconds? Someone um, walking. Mm -hmm. What else? Your voice. Yeah, my voice when I talked. Shiny when she talked, right? I heard, I'll tell you what I heard. I heard kind of like the sound of someone kind of going like this, right? Or like shuffling a piece of paper, something like that, right? And, you know, I know because I asked you all to unmute, you were probably very conscious about not making sound, right? And being polite and, and quiet. But, you know, what's interesting is that this is something that we take for granted when we are physically in the same room that we do not live in a vacuum and that that ambient noise, right? The soundscape of our environment, it, it creates an underlying texture and energy that tells us that we are here and we are live and sharing this space together, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, how do we, without thinking about it, normally use Zoom? Everyone mute yourselves except for the person who's talking and that is how we will efficiently get business done. And that makes perfect sense, right? In business, but it is absolutely antithetical to fostering a sense of shared space and connectedness. So what happens then if you've joined a Zoom show and are invited to unmute yourselves and to stay unmuted throughout the show, especially in contrast to our expectations that this is a video chat taboo, there is an immediate sense of electricity and vulnerability in the room, and perhaps even more than when we sit in a physical theater safe in the anonymity of darkness. The point of me talking about all this isn't to tell you specifically, you know, what you can do to create an effective experience in a virtual world. I, I mean, yes, if any of you do happen to be putting together your own Zoom show, great, I hope this helps. But 
what I'm trying to convey is a broader idea of approaching what we do with intent. So much of the world spent a good portion of the pandemic in denial of reality, you know, trying to just weather the storm and wait for when things return to a normal that will, I mean, let, let's face it, will never actually come. And even when folks did try to take action and to pivot time and time again, we saw people and organizations stuck in old models and modes of thinking. And I don't blame them. Massive change is terrifying. And everything that I'm saying is as much a critique of myself as it is of others. I mean, if I have one regret from my experience through the pandemic, it's that I waited as long as I did before finally choosing to take action. And granted, some of that initial time not pivoting to virtual was spent with intent. Just prior to everything shutting down, I had been booked to do a month-long run of in-person shows at a local theater in Pittsburgh later that year. So when everything did hit the fan, I figured, okay, no worries. I'll just use this time to work on writing and creating that show. And when this all blows over in you know, a month or two, uh, go back to business as usual. Well, a month or two later, I run out of steam. And the next several months, I spend uh, not writing or working on anything in particular, but instead making very good use of my wife's Netflix account. <laughs> Uh, it's not until six months into our world shutting down that I I'm finally able to put aside my doubts and my fears enough to actually give creating work in the virtual world a real try. And for all the good that did come out of this eventual project, one thing I wonder is what might have been if I'd gotten started just a few months earlier? And you'll hear why that timing is especially pivotal when I talk about our run in New York, and our attempts to monetize misconnections beyond. So that brings me to lesson number three. The world might still outpace you. So this third and final lesson, I actually want to talk about through the words of my partner, Alex Gruen, which he wrote for a guest lecture and performance we gave at a graduate class at Northwestern. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be with us for today's talk, but uh, I will do my best to channel my inner Alex. So give me one moment. I'm just going to pull up his, uh, his notes. All right. Lesson number three, the world might still outpace you. So uh, this third, uh, uh, what he said was, I felt at the tail end of the Chicago run and given our success in that market, that misconnections had a viable chance at becoming a similar success in New York City, presented virtually at a theater off Broadway. Why make that move? Well, this type of run could lend the show additional brand equity and credibility as only a New York run can. See, most theatrical properties that are produced on and off Broadway lose money in their initial runs, but are often able to reclaim that money for investors with runs in other markets, tours, and through licensing, deal, licensing deals because of the brand cache created by being in a New York house. Uh, here's an interesting tidbit. Nearly every single one of Stephen Sondheim's shows failed to earn back its investment in their initial run. Flash forward many years later, and we all know about their successes. Sweeney Todd is produced in every middle school and at every community theater known to mankind. That's where the money is made. Now. The success we were striving for with Misconnections is slightly different. Licensing the show was never the ambition because John's the only one who can perform it. Rather, it was to continue to fortify and amplify its brand so that John could be booked to perform it in other markets around the world. And what's also uniquely interesting about virtual from a business perspective, uh, as Shane pointed out before, is that operating costs are extremely low across time and space and you can reach anyone across the world. Whereas weekly running costs on Broadway or off-Broadway for an in-person show can be in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, costs can be in just the hundreds of dollars when deployed virtually. Costs are relatively immaterial. Not to mention with misconnections, nearly all of our costs were fixed and John didn't have to leave his house in Pittsburgh even if and when the show was being performed off-Broadway. No housing, no set, no rental fees, no lights, no union staff, no sound, no nothing. 
just the screen and audience and John and a great and a great script and what he had in his house. Genius, right? The future of the American theater. The world might still outpace you. We end up getting a virtual run, like John mentioned earlier, at Off Broadway's 59E59, and layered on a few additional producing partnerships from other markets. Uh, Affirmation, uh, a Red Orchid Theater from Chicago, Wesley Stace's Cabinet of Wonders, and Oddly Correct Coffee in Kansas City. Uh, each of these brands had similar brand ethos to that of Misconnections. And especially in Oddly Correct Coffee's case, um, as you experienced at the beginning of today's presentation, also have explicit ties to the content. These brands also had the potential of engaging additional non-traditional theater audiences that we thought could be excited about and interested in our show. We could perform for audiences all over the country without having to raise money to go on tour. Genius, right? The future of the American theater. The uh, world might still outpace you. <laughs> we opened a little over a year ago off Broadway. And the virtual transfer was boldly announced on Playbill.com. John Ty and Alex Gruen's Play With Magic Misconnections gets a virtual New York transfer. What played out was fascinating. Whereas the world was still on hold in February in Chicago at a Red Orchid before vaccines were available to the general public. By the time May rolled around, if you recall, things started opening up again. The first week of shows in New York sold well, but despite positive word of mouth from the first week's audience, members of the press and the paying public were simply and very suddenly no longer interested in attending virtual theater. Virtual theater became passe pretty much overnight. Folks were vaccinated. They could go outside again. Why endure more time on Zoom when you could go back and be in a real theater? Ticket sales sagged. The modality, the means of delivery, that which was the vehicle for opportunity for this extraordinary venture and adventure ultimately became its Achilles heel. Uh, the biggest disappointment was when Elizabeth Vincentelli, one of the theater critics from the New York Times, actually came to see the show, but never ended up posting a review. The Times and other publications were simply over virtual theater. Because of our operating model, we recouped and even made money on the New York run, something that nearly 80% of New York shows can't claim. But the run, despite the off-Broadway brand and all of its positive attributes, was not nearly as successful as either of us had expected. And that, unfortunately, was, yep, you guessed it, because the world had simply outpaced us. We innovated and delivered a cutting-edge show beloved by audiences and a profitable business model for theater designed for the virtual medium but the need and appetite for this type of content diminished as more and more folks became vaccinated. Our show closed down as the world opened up. A mutual friend threw some marketing dollars behind the show after the fact and tried to generate some traction around it on Eventbrite and through some social media marketing plays only to discover once again that the world had simply moved on. Uh, I moved on to other projects, this is Alex speaking, and a full-time uh, position in EdTech John started to work again in person. We were at a crossroads as the world took a sharp right turn. Even when you seize the moment, even when you lean into abstraction and do something unique and special and maybe even revolutionary, you can't control the world around you. Uh, operating conditions today in the never normal are capricious and occasionally pretty cruel. And so what do you do? You keep on keeping on. Get back in the driver's seat, put the pedal to the metal and go. Uh, back to John. Wow, thank so, you, John. Uh, yeah, what happened, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened after that, right? So it's the, it's the latter half of, of 2021. You know, we are in the middle of hot back summer, also known as the rise of Omicron. And despite that, things are beginning to open back up. And you know, we're returning to in-person activities and performance. And that month-long run of in-person shows that I was booked to do back in 2020 has now been rescheduled for the third time to March of 2022. But this time it looks like it's actually going to happen. I remember prior to that show, uh, coming back to perform at an in-person event for the first time. Over the course of an afternoon, limited groups of people were invited to take a walkthrough of the small intimate theater that that run of shows was to take place in. Uh, as they passed through, I would share a moment of magic with them in the main theater space. And 
I remember being taken aback by something I felt. I missed performing virtually. Uh, the experience of going from uh, virtual back to in-person felt in many ways akin to the experience of being forced to go from in-person to virtual. Like, like I was having to rediscover how to work in this medium that was familiar, but at the same time, strangely alien. You know, even though the groups passing through were small, I felt a loss of that uh, inherent sense of intimacy that's created on Zoom when we are immediately thrust into each other's homes. And in a theater, instead of having a mute button at their disposal, there was the safety and barrier of the fourth wall to hide behind. And that afternoon, what I most starkly realized was that being in person is not an automatic solution to all the issues we experienced when forced to connect virtually. That simply being able to go back to this medium that we've been uh, familiar and comfortable with is not a panacea for that, for all that we've missed and ached for throughout the separation of the pandemic. The play with magic that we created for this in-person run uh, was called Road Signs. And it's based on that quintessential soul-searching American road trip I took all those years ago. And it's very much an extension of what we started exploring with Misconnections, using magic as a means to an end rather than as the end in of itself, as a tool in a work of drama to explore certain ideas and narrative rather than just presenting a series of tricks. And it's also an extension of continuing to build something intentionally for the medium in which it's to be presented. I could go on and get into the details, but I think I've probably done more than enough talking for now. So maybe it'd be better to do a little bit of showing rather than telling. We started our time together today sharing with me sharing one of the opening pieces from our virtual show, Misconnections. So I thought it might be really cool to bookend our talk with sharing a private recording of the opening piece from our in-person play with magic, Road Signs, after which we'll go ahead and open up the floor to any questions. And then we can just chat and, and talk about whatever you're curious to dig into further with whatever time uh, we have remaining. Okay, All right. John, do you so, mind? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm curious about in, uh, in person and virtual meeting. Uh, I still think about it. But do you mind, since it's 45 minutes, we have a middle in, in the mission. I will play one of your video about five minutes, and then we will come back so everybody can exercise a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, sure, no problem. Why don't we take a break? Shiny, instead of playing a video, uh, okay, well, why don't you just leave the room open? If you need to run to the use the restroom, you can go ahead and do that. Or if you want to just stay yeah, and hang out and chat, that. we can we can do that. So I will share this video. Yeah. Oh, Shiny, Shiny. What I'm yeah. saying is, why don't, why don't we not play the video? So oh, okay. we can let everyone take a break. But if anyone wants to just hang out, we can just hang out and chat and, and be casual rather than okay, then I will just the, okay I will mute and everybody still can talk okay mm -hmm. yeah actually shiny would you mind closing the video because I think it takes over everyone's screen if it's playing. Oh, okay okay yeah that'd be great thank you you're welcome okay yeah let's come oh, back. appreciate it shiny yeah, so we'll take uh we'll take five minutes and right around eight fifty five fifty six ish, um yeah we'll come back. Yeah, did you go to the? Uh, I heard about I think it's Las Vegas. They have a yearly a big show for magician. Did you go there? Did, can you introduce what kind of show? The big show once a year, I guess. I'm not sure the conference or. Do you recommend mm -hmm. people go there to learn some magic skill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every year in Vegas, there's a big magic convention called Magic Live. Um, it's one of the largest uh, yearly conventions in the world. Um, uh, I've never actually been myself. Uh, I think someday probably I'll, I'll go. But um, in terms of whether I recommend other people go or not, it, it's it would certainly be a fun time, though Hello. I would say... 
<laughs> hello, hello. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I would say, um, unless uh, unless you are really passionate about magic and wanting to learn more about it or experience more of it, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going as a non-magician. Um, I would more recommend, unless if you're not interested in learning magic, but you're just interested in experiencing more magic, I would recommend just seeking out um, different magic shows that are created for the public. You know, there's a there's an interesting kind of disconnect that happens between magic that magicians create and perform for other magicians versus magic that people create and perform for non-magicians. Um, and I think they're both really interesting, but I think they're not really, like one is not good for the other audience and vice versa, right? And so a better experience as a non-magician would be, would be experience a show that someone created specifically for an audience of non-magicians, right? Um, if you are interested in learning magic, uh, I would probably hold off on spending, you know, I think it's like $500 or something for, a, for an entrance ticket to the convention. Um, but with the advent of the internet and online, like YouTube and, and e-commerce, you know, most of the secrets of magic honestly are accessible through books and videos that you can buy online or even a lot of free content on YouTube. Um, and so I would kind of just start there and, and ex start exploring on your own and see what you like and don't like. And, and if you continue having fun, continue down that path, then you can, you can kind of take it from there, right? Yeah. So I know, uh, I know a bunch of y'all are, I think in Texas, right? Um, so, and then Shane's in the Northwest is, uh, and then some folks in Taiwan. Um, yeah, is anyone, is anyone else from anywhere else in the country? Uh, this is Eva. Uh, I was from DFW Dallas, Texas, but right now I am in Taiwan temporarily. Uh, John, I have a question. Uh, most yeah. of the magician uh, we all under we all understand is a kind of a street trick magic, a kind of a street mm -hmm. trick. It's a totally. It's a very different to what uh, to you as a mind reading magician. To me, the mind reading it's it's not playing the trick. It's kind of a, a, a real skill you have to build up. You have to build on, or especially with your psychology background. So I was a, probably I should save this question in the Q and A session. Uh, the how to, uh, the, the the mind reading is a is a is that a kind of a trainable skill, or because you mentioned about that you are not a natural mind reader, or or, or a wizard at all, but now mm -hmm. you are mind reading. So I wonder, yeah, uh, is this a, a trained question. skill? Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I'll give a short answer now, and then when we get to the Q and A, let's put a please remember, and I'll try to remember as well, and I'll come back and talk more about it at length. The short answer now Thank is, you. the short answer now is um, no. I'm not a real mind reader, and it is a trick. And uh, probably almost anyone in the world who claims to be a real mind reader is lying to you or to themselves. <laughs> uh, so I'll talk more about that uh, when we uh, when we get back from our break. And uh, yeah, I have the same question as Eva. Um, like a, as a magician, you learn a lot. You need to know literature, arts science, uh, how you how you build up all the skill in one? <laughs> what you doing yeah, like it's a a... Daily, your daily schedule? Do you do something about art or something sometimes? How, how you do it? To polish that's a great question stuff. too. Yeah, you know, as a magician, that, I think that's part of what's really fun about magic is that it, it kind of is a crossing of many, many different disciplines. Right, um, and so it gives you a really wide variety of experience, and and the more you kind of learn and experience in other fields other than magic directly, the more it can it can feed back into magic and your performance and what you create, right? And I think that's really true of any of any kind of art form or any skill. But I think it, magic in particular, you tend to have to wear a lot of different hats, right? Because it's like there's the craft of magic, the actual physical skill, if you do sleight of hand or learning, you know, just techniques and everything. And that in itself can take, 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours in a lifetime to practice and master. And, you know, you never really master it, but, but, you know, that in itself is like a full-time thing. But then, you know, if you want to take your work further than just a, than just a demonstration of craft, then it's like, okay, you've got to learn how to write, right? You've got to learn how to act, how to perform, how to actually speak and present and uh, how to direct. You're directing yourself often. Uh, and many magicians aren't lucky enough to be able to work with a good friend or an actual other outside director, but that can be extremely helpful and useful, right? You have to understand drama and theater. It's like, and, 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 and. Uh, and so, you know, part of the challenge of it is that the work and, and the skill set you need to build is kind of endless, but that's also part of what, what makes it really rewarding and really fun, right? Yeah. So I know we've uh, we've taken a few minutes. I think uh, by now everyone should be back. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, basically, if, when we performed, uh, when I performed the month long run of Road Signs at a theater here in Pittsburgh, we recorded a couple of the performances. Uh, and so uh, what I want to share right now is actually a recording of the opening piece uh, from the show. I thought that might be a cool thing so you can see the transition from virtual to in person and then we'll come back and uh, and then we can just chat for the for the time that we have left. All right. So give me one sec to uh, get my screen shared. Boop, boop, share video. Okay. And then here we go. All right. It's about to start playing. Uh, someone just shout out if you can't, uh, if you don't see it or you can't hear it, but I think it should be good. I am so excited to share this story. Welcome to Road Signs. I have something to show you. It's something that I am holding in my hand. It's a paradox, but you won't see it that way, uh, at least not yet. Right now, it's nothing more than an object that, uh, <laughs> that you have seen and that you will see in almost every magician's act. It won't actually become a paradox for another six minutes or so. In the meantime, I need someone to keep it safe and to keep it a secret. Hello. Hi. Uh, will you say your name for everyone? Giovanni. Giovanni. I need to pass this to you in a way that you don't see what it is and that no one else sees either. So will you cup your, <laughs> yeah, you're good where you are. Will you cup your hands together like a bowl for me? Perfect. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to look away while I drop this into your hands. Now, uh, this might feel a little strange, uh, but the moment you feel something hit your palms, will you close your hands around the object, lock your fingers tight? Okay. All right, here we go. Look away. No peeking, anybody. Close your hands, lock your fingers. Perfect. Now, we need some cash. So. <laughs> If you know you have some on you, maybe a few dollar bills or bills of different types, will you take out your wallets and hold them up in the air? The whole thing would be lovely. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can use one of my bills if we need to, but it would really be best if we could borrow one of yours. So hold up your wallets if you have them. All right. Uh, Giovanni, I'm going to go into the rest of the group for a few minutes. While I do that, please do keep your hands tightly around the object, and again, do not let anyone, including yourself, see what it is. Okay. All right? I promise I'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, hold up your wallets if you have them. Let's see. Uh, what is your name, sir? Ernie. Ernie. Mind if I grab your wallet for a bit? Sure. Thanks, Ernie. <laughs> the exact right amount of hesitation. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's see what Ernie has here. Careful <laughs> now. Oh, oh. Ernie is, what I would say, uh, relatively flush with cash, which is great. But Ernie, don't worry. I'm only going to borrow a dollar. 
Uh, but before we go on, I, I just need to confirm. Uh, I was saying hi to folks as we as you came into the theater. Um, I don't think we ran into each other, did we? No. No. So this is the first time we're meeting. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And I didn't try to approach you before the show. Try to pass you one of my own dollars. Nothing like that. No. Okay. Great. I'm gonna hold this up. So you can put your wallets away, thank you. <laughs> Ernie's, Ernie's will suffice for tonight. <laughs> um, I'm going to hold this up so hopefully you all can see. And uh, I'm just going to reach in to borrow, uh, not the 20, uh, but just the dollar. OK. Ernie, thank you very much. Sure. So look, I know that most of us have only just met. but. I need to ask something of each and every one of you right now. For the next few minutes, I need all of you to commit to staring at Ernie's dollar <laughs> and not looking away. Because if over the next few minutes you think that I'm somehow able to uh, switch the bill or that there's another bill in play or anything like that, then this will kind of all be pointless. So I won't ask you to sustain this for long. But just for the next few minutes, will you all commit to staring at Ernie's dollar and not looking away? Yeah? All right. There are a few other things that we need to do to get to where we're going. Ernie, would you uh, grab this pen and click it open? And I'm going to ask you to reach up and just scribble your initials somewhere on your bill. Maybe just avoid covering the serial number if you can. Okay. That's good. Great. And just for good measure, would you pass the pen to anyone around you, someone maybe you don't know? Sure. Hello, someone Ernie doesn't know. Uh, what's your name? Connor. Connor. Uh, Connor, part of my reach, guys. But I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. If you'll reach up and scribble your initials, just avoid covering the serial number. Perfect. I can take that. All right. Ernie, Connor, I need both of you to take a really good look at your initials. All right. Make sure that when you see this again in a moment, Mm -hmm. that you will recognize this as the same bill and no other? Yes. All right. Now, I would also like for us to note the eight-digit serial number on the bill. <laughs> I realize that might seem like overkill, but trust me, it's, it's necessary for what's about to happen. So um, uh, what's your name, sir? Eric. Hey, Eric. I'm going to ask you to read off the serial number nice and loud. Uh, you sure. can ignore the letters in the front and in the back. Right. And uh, will everyone to this side of the room Please help remember the first four digits. All right? Okay. Eric, nice and loud. Yeah, sure. 2542. All right, so that's 2542. So let's repeat them back. So 2542. Two, two. All right, and then will everyone to this side of the room please help remember the last four? All right, so if you would. 1045. All right, so that's 1045. So 1045. One, All right, first four, one more time. And the last four? One, zero, four, five. Mostly killing it. <laughs> but good enough. I think most of us got it, so that'll work. There's one more thing that I want to do to mark this bill, uh, which is to just tear a small piece of it. <laughs> OK. Maybe more like a large uh, a quarter, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, this piece, I am going to place down right here. And I will not come back near it. All right.
Giovanni, since before we started any of this, right, before we even borrowed a, a bill from Eric over here, Ernie. or Ernie, Ernie, sorry. I like Eric. Yeah. <laughs> but before any of that happened, you've been holding on to something clasped tight between your hands, yeah? Yeah. And you've genuinely felt a, a physical object there, right? I didn't just pretend to drop something in your hands, nothing like that. Oh, it's still in there. Yeah. <laughs> Gio, can you describe for us what the object feels like? Sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, paper, maybe? Folded paper? Uh, like, like folded paper. Will you slowly open your hands and show us what you're holding? It's a dollar. Gio, open it up. Is it missing a piece? It is missing a piece. <laughs> Look at the serial number. Call out the first four digits again. And the last four? One, zero, four, five. Gio, nice and loud, ignoring the letters, will you read off the serial number on that bill? Two, five, four, two, one, zero, four, five. And Gio, you can see the initials on the bill, right? Holy shit. <laughs> and look, look, look. If we, if we bring it back to the missing piece, it's not just close, but fiber for fiber, it is the exact match. Uh, well. Are these definitely your initials on the bill? And Ernie, are these definitely your initials on the bill? Yes. Gio, ladies and gentlemen. All righty. So that was the uh, that was the opening to road signs, and uh, that was my talk today. So um, I, I see in the chat, and I'm sorry I didn't see it earlier, but Irene, uh, Irene, are you still here? Maybe. Do we have an Irene here? You might be muted if you are. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hi. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. Good, good to see you. Oops, I turned off my video by accident. Let me turn my video back on and I'm gonna actually remove my spotlight. Um, for the Q&A and just chatting, I recommend everyone switching to gallery view if you're not there already. You'd click on view in the upper right and then click on gallery and that way we'll all be able to see each other. But um, Irene, I see your question. Uh, I'll read it for everyone if you haven't seen it in the chat. Uh, Irene asked, do you go to a school to learn the trade? Um, and yeah, really interesting question, Irene. Um, you know, what's funny is there are schools for magic that exists and programs. There's one in uh, Las Vegas called um, that a guy named Jeff McBride started called Jeff McBride's uh, School of Magic and Mystery, I believe it is. And uh, actually, you probably most of you probably wouldn't know this, but in Spain, um, there is a school of magic started by a man named uh, Arturo Escanio. And, and Juan Tamariz, and it's like a Spanish school of magic, and they're actually really world renowned for their excellent card magicians. Um, so there are schools that exist, but I never actually attended any of them. And I think it's probably pretty rare that most magicians would attend them, at least when they're first starting out, maybe later in life. But a lot of, um, a lot of how I learned was just by, by reading books and looking at videos and, and just kind of working independently and practicing things on my own and just spending <laughs> hours upon hours in my bedroom, you know? Um, and then also just through performing and sharing magic. Um, so yeah. Uh, let's see. And then Ava uh, posted her, uh, reposted her question about um, mind reading. So I, I do want to talk about that a bit more. Um, and, you know, if you have as we're talking to, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to unmute and, and shout them out. You know, if we talk over each other, no worries, we'll, we'll figure it out. But I'd rather that than uh, us kind of stay silent in politeness, right? Um, but so I, I do want to reiterate that I am a totally normal, well, I'm not a normal human being. I am as weird and odd as every other single person on this planet, right? In my own ways. But I am, 
I am a totally normal human being in that I don't have any special powers that any other human being uh, wouldn't have anything like that. You know, there's no, there's no real magic going on. Uh, and that, I, I know that might seem a little blunt and disappointing to say that the, the mind reading is a trick, right? It, it is an illusion uh, and it has methods that exist in our physical, you know, and psychological reality. But what's funny is I think, I think that knowledge is actually what makes magic powerful, right? It is, it is the contradiction between our intellectual understood reality and the reality we experience when we experience a really good magic trick, right? It, it's like we go into a magic show or seeing a piece of magic in our minds knowing, okay, what is about to happen cannot actually happen. It is not possible. And yet emotionally, physically in the moment, emotionally, we, we experience something as real. It's like, okay, that thing that we know is impossible literally just happened or at least felt like it happened, right? And it's that contradiction between our understood intellectual reality and our emotional experience reality, you know, butting heads that I think leads to that bubbling feeling of astonishment, right? And, and the, moment, the moment anyone starts to believe that the magic is actually real, I think you're actually, you end up cheating yourself of the experience a little bit, right? Where yes, maybe something can still be amazing or astonishing, but it's amazing or astonishing in the same way that say juggling eight balls in the air is amazing, right? Like it's amazing because it's difficult to do, but, but it's no longer magic because it's something that we understand to be possible, right? Um, so yeah, that is, a, that is an important point that I do wanna make clear because there is also a very large industry of, of so-called psychics and mediums who, you know, get into very moral gray and dark territory in what they claim to be able to do. And I think, I, I think there can be something really, there's something really distasteful and, and I think just plainly morally wrong about taking advantage of people's emotions through deception, right? Um, when you come to see a magic show, Yes, I am using deception, but there's this unspoken contract where we walk into the room or we enter the virtual room with this understanding that I am going to use deceptive techniques to create the impression of something impossible, right? But there, there's kind of an unspoken contract of, of what kind of deception I'm going to use, right? But I think, I think truth and magic is actually really, is surprisingly like really important. It sounds like a contradiction, but, you know, I want to be, I always want to be honest about my dishonesty, right? and honest about my honesty, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, uh, Ava, I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and if anyone has any kind of follow-up or want to talk, wants to talk about that further, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going through the chat box list, uh, addressed all the questions. The next one is, is it legal to rip <laughs> a dollar bill? Is good, illegal good to question, rip a Kate. dollar bill? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. I think it is. I think so. What I know is, if you rip, if you are missing a piece of a dollar, it is still good as legal tender as long as you have some percentage of it. I think it's something like it, it's definitely obviously over fifty percent, but I forget what the exact number is. And so, you know, if you're missing like a corner of your dollar, you can still spend it legally. Uh, Technically, what is not legal is writing or defacing any currency. Um, but you know, we'll we'll keep that a secret here in this room and you know across Facebook Live, I guess. So yeah. I thought you were gonna put put a dollar back in in one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just uh just gonna burn it, swallow it, and and bring it back. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, actually, in in road signs in the show where it left off the way the show continues is um is i actually burn both pieces of the dollar and, and drink it again uh why you might ask well you might have to see the show to find out <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see ava asks um did your psychology background bring you closer and faster to be a mind reading magician so Another good question. Yeah, it's funny because my background in education um, would seem to be very in line with what I'm doing. Though I will say this, I don't consider myself a mind reading magician. I, I consider myself a magician and I 
perform magic in a variety of styles and 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 types, right? So for example, the dollar piece from Road Signs, it's not mind reading at all. It's not psych it is there are psychological principles happening to create the entire experience, but it's actually a very physical piece of magic, right? An object uh, exists in two places at the same time, vanishes, reappears, right? There's nothing really mental about that piece of magic, right? Um, I certainly do do a lot of psychological illusions too, and I find them fascinating. And so what I think is interesting is really not, not defining the type of magician I am by the magic that I do. I think of all the magic in the world as potential tools that I can use to create a specific kind of experience, right? And so whether that's a piece of mind reading, whether that's a piece of physical magic, whether that's a piece of stage magic or something virtually, you know, all of it is, I think, fair game as long as it feeds towards whatever specific goal I'm working towards for a specific show or a specific experience. And also that it's in line with my personality and my style, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I realize also as I read the questions, I'm basically reading the question and then saying an answer, which is a lot of talking. So I'm going to put you all to work a little. Uh, I see um, Kate had another question. Uh, Kate, would you mind uh, unmuting and, and asking it? So I was asking, how did the beer water taste? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Kate, do you have a dollar with you? Not right now. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, there goes my first suggestion. <laughs> now, but what I'll tell you, what's funny is I don't actually, I'm not really sure what it tastes like. And that's because. Uh, this is something I learned early on. And these are all the little things you learn by actually going through a thing. Um, you know, at, at, everything, every good idea is only as good on paper as until you actually go through it, right? And so I knew I wanted to burn the dollar and drink it. But I also, when I was rehearsing and practicing for the show, I also didn't want to just eat a bunch of dollar bills, right? So, so I didn't actually do it until um, the final... Uh, no, the second to last dress rehearsal before we opened, right? So we had kind of a practice run. And during that dress rehearsal, I burned the dollar, I mix it into the water and I'm drinking it. And what I realized is that the water moves faster than the ash, right? <laughs> and so I drank it too slowly and I drank all the water, but there was still ash in the cup. And so I realized too late. So I tried to throw it back, but then I didn't have any more water to, to get it down. So I had like little bits of bill kind of in my mouth. And then um, the other mistake I made is I didn't put enough water in the in the jug. So I didn't have any more water to, to pour. So I, I had nothing to get, to get it down, except I'm, I'm performing. So there's nothing to do, but just go on. And so I'm just trying to swallow it as best as I can. And I remember I, I go on, I hit the next line and I, okay, I hope no one noticed, but I say the next words and I just see, a little piece of dollar ash just shoot out of my mouth <laughs> and flutter to the ground. And so that was that was the closest I ever got to tasting it. But honestly, I don't really remember in the adrenaline. And so what I learned later is you have to you have to drink until there's one gulp left. And then when there's one gulp left, you have to throw it back and you're basically just swallowing it. So you don't really taste it at all. Right. Um, yeah. And so now if you or the uh, little one next to you is curious to try, you now have all the information you need to, to give it a go. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, Chuni, Chuni Lee. You still here? Yeah, I'm here, but it's Chow who has the question. <laughs> oh, what's up? What's your question? Oh, well, yeah, so I think you've described that uh, actually it's, a, it's actually a job, right? So, you, you had to do the job and uh, like continue to create a new tweet. Just wondering that like, typically how to go, what you go, uh, had gone through in terms of creating the tweet, uh, of course, without revealing all your secrets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll answer that by answering a related question that I often get asked too, which is a lot of people ask like, oh, do you create your own tricks, right? In the first place, right? And the best analogy I've kind of come up with is that it's kind of like, 
it's kind of like a chef who writes recipes, right? <clears throat> like the chef doesn't invent the chicken or the lettuce or the tomato or the plum, right? They're just ingredients, but, but the chef takes the ingredients and puts them together in hopefully new and unique and interesting ways that, um, that makes it their own, right? It makes it something unique to them. And so that's often what magic is. There's actually very little in magic that is created that is truly absolutely original, but there's so much history of creation that, that we build on that it's kind of like building up a toolbox, just like how tricks themselves are tools, the components that make up the tricks, the techniques, the methods, they're all individual tools that can be taken and put together in different and unique ways, right? And so I've been I've been studying magic for long enough that my toolbox has gotten larger and larger, and it will I will continue to expand the toolbox for the rest of my life in magic. Um, but uh, a lot of it, like the dollar piece, was something that I originally learned from another magician named Nate Staniforth, who put out a book, and and but he created that piece of magic from another book he read years ago by a guy named Barry Richardson. And he took some of those techniques that he learned there and techniques he learned elsewhere and put them, put them together into this piece. And then I took Nate Staniforth's piece and I modified some of the technical handling and then also the way it's presented and the context and the scripting to make it my own and make it work for my show, right? And so that's kind of how, I think that's kind of often how it works for many people. And certainly that's how it works for me. It's kind of building as much knowledge as I can so that I have as much fodder to play with. And then when I'm creating something, idea, grabbing ideas from different places and, and forming them and, and letting them evolve into something new that hopefully is right for me, right? That I can be proud of, yeah. Cool, nice for your question. Um, Ava, uh, what's your next question? All right, you really want to put your audience into work. <laughs> yes, yes, very much. I think it's nice. I think it's nice hearing your voices, you know, and, and having a conversation. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I just wonder, uh, each show, since you are saying uh, it's not a skill, mind reading, it's not skill. It's a still a a kind of a street street trick. So each show will have its own risk of a failing. What were you thinking in that critical moment? Were you nervous of a failing failure? And how did you how did you handle that or face it if you ever have any failure on the, the on, on the yeah, spur good, of the moment? Yeah, good question. Um, Eva, can I can I ask you a question? Um, sure. Are you sure. Uh, are you retired or are you still working or is there any? Uh, I'm is there retired. Any sort of, okay. I'm is there retired. any sort of um, is there any sort of hobby you used to do or or what did you used to do for work? Before I retire, before the pandemic, mm -hmm. I do traveling, I do Toastmaster, I do dancing, and I do, uh, si I do singing. Amazing. I went to the choir. Oh, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so have you ever, I guess, during, let's say, a performance, like while, let's say, dancing or doing a Toastmaster or anything, um, what, are, what goes through your head in terms of uh, failure or mistakes or anything like that. I, I just keep on telling myself it is just a practice. It is just an experience. I try, especially the Toastmaster, when you are in on the stage, on the stage for public speaking, uh, probably just a treat to all the all the audiences. Uh, imagine they're naked. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah imagine they're naked for me for me i i've never actually done that trick in particular but i sometimes what i try to do is i imagine everyone in the audience is a is an old friend right um and so i i think our experiences are probably very similar right uh, of course i make mistakes because i'm human uh, because we're all human you know no matter what you're doing whether it's brain surgery or magic or taking out the garbage like you're gonna trip sometimes right <laughs> that's just what happens and so um, you know, I think, I think the real key about mistakes or failure is to, is to understand and accept that that's just part of nature, part of life. If you do something enough times, you're going to mess up sometimes. Right. And that's, that's okay. Um, and I think it's more about your attitude, right. How you internalize it and how you handle it. Right. Like if you're a Toastmaster or you're on stage, if you, if you make a mistake, if you forget a word or you forget a line or something, what do you do? You, you, you can either just stop and crumple right which is 
terrible, not just for you, but for the audience, right? Because most people are kind and they don't want to see you fail, right? And so it's painful to see someone making a mistake and, and, and feeling that pain through them, right? But if you, uh, for me, what I try to remember is like, you know, it's about, it's about the human connection and about the experience. And again, the magic, the theater, it's all, they're all tools to create experience, right? But the experience is the end, the experience with each other is the end goal, right? And so, so even if the magic sometimes goes wrong, as long as I'm okay with that, and I'm, and I remember to internalize, like, we're still here sharing this moment. And in some ways, when mistakes happen, those are some of the best moments, right? Because there's, there's something electric that you can feel in the room when you sense that something's going a little off the rails, right? Because it's suddenly, you know, in the back of your minds, you know that like, if I'm doing a show that I've done this show 10, 20, 30, a hundred times, right? But if suddenly something seems to be happening that's not completely planned, it's like suddenly everyone's there, right? Like we're all here and we're in this moment and you're thrust into the present. And that's, that's, super exciting right it's just electricity when that happens and hopefully then you know you can bring it back to a conclusion and bring it back on the rails right but i think it again it just comes back down to attitude you know how you how you internalize it yourself and then what energy you 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 put back out right yeah. all right thank you thank you john since yeah, since you are absolutely. going to ask the since you are going to interact with the audience directly, I would just, just save, my, uh, save typing my question here in the chat box. I'm going to ask it directly. Yeah. Uh, one question uh, is... Uh, sorry, let me, let me do something advertising first before uh, your Q&A and before uh, Shane close the show. I would like to encourage everybody, if you're interested in Pong Pong Future speech speaker, uh, email us, it's on the chat box. So today I will show you a trick I practice. Okay, I shovel the car uh, here. Okay, and I show you the uh, here. I need to practice it too. Okay, I put it back. Hold on, I always need to show in the camera. Okay, one, two, three. Ta -da! I change the car. It's an easy trick. If you want to learn, email shinystarada.usa at gmail.com for our future event too. Okay, and so now I pass back to the Eva's uh, um, Q&A. Thank you. Oh, and uh, famous Lucy's uh, feedback. And then we will let Shane close the show. Thank you. Anybody feel free to ask any question. Continue. I have a question. Uh, I think I got skipped. And I, I know you said, uh, John, that you weren't a mind reader. Uh, so I guess you're not into psychic stuff either. But I wondered if you knew why the chicken went to a seance. <laughs> uh, to get to the other side? Exactly. Yeah. You are a mind reader. <laughs> uh, that's great. I I want to try to remember that one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I and also, you know, I I find that I'm a skeptic of these things because of the work I do and because I know because I just know about techniques to create the illusion of these things being real. But I am absolutely fascinated by all of it, you know, by spiritualism, by seances um by the history of it and, and and that's part of the contradiction in myself too which is a part of what i love about magic is that that possibility for mystery right with a capital m you know and, and there's a part of me that that god will want for nothing more than to encounter some real deep mystery that i can't explain right but part of that too is tempering it with the knowledge that any extraordinary claim requires extraordinary proof right um and so and so, yeah, there's a funny push and pull of, of having this openness to possibility, but also the recognition of, of odds and what reality is for the most part, at least as we understand it today, right? Um, yeah, I think we might have time for maybe one or two more questions. Ava, I know, I know you had well, one. So uh, Ava, what was your question? And then we'll, if we have one more, we can uh, do one more. All right, um, my question to you, and the last one is, if, John, if you were in my shoes, 
uh, uh, if people interview you, if you were in my shoes, what is that question that you that you would love to answer, but I did not ask? <laughs> oh man, what a toughie! What a fascinating, tough question. Um... God, I don't know. What's all right? What's on my mind? What's on my mind right now, Ava, uh, is and it's something I kind of forgot to talk about. So I guess in that, in this way, in this particular moment, if someone had asked me about this, I would have been like, "Oh, thank you. I forgot to talk about this," which is uh, what's next, right? Uh, like all of this, all of this is a continuing journey, uh, and there's no. It, it's like you know, in a neat presentation, it can feel like, "Oh, this is the neat." arc of how my work has gone and and I've quote unquote made it or anything but I certainly don't feel that way uh like I'm still figuring it out you know and I with the pandemic and everything I I've yet to find a place of real kind of stability which is interesting and fun but also terrifying in its own way you know that kind of thing and so um in March we in March the roadsides opened and premiered and ran for uh 30 shows uh, throughout the month and uh alex and i we worked on it together and we are just so proud of the work and, and i still feel really i feel really connected to the show uh still um you know it's a show about um our collective dreams and the journeys that we each go on to <clears throat> basically find or search for whatever it is that we're looking for um and so we'd very much like for the show to have a life beyond the month that it had in Pittsburgh. And so Alex and I have been talking and, and playing around with some ideas and dreams of our own to basically form a nationwide tour for the show, to basically perform it in regional theaters around the country. And then also also potentially, you know, answer the question of what would it look like? Because the show, the show is kind of based around kind of creating this campfire space with the audience, uh, this communal space. And so one of the questions we've had is, what would it look like to perform the show literally outdoors, you know, literally potentially build a fire together um, and perform it in state parks, national parks, that kind of thing. Um, and so all this is still in the very, very early stages, but um, part of the dream for the tour is potentially to perform the show in all 48 contiguous uh, states uh, in the continental US. Um, but we'll see. So more on that, more on that as time goes on. But uh, if you would, uh, I'll do a, that's a good segue to a quick pitch. Uh, if you would like to follow uh, my work and be, you know, know of when upcoming performances are coming up, um, you can go on my website. Uh, it's um, here, I will send a quick link uh, in the chat. Uh, but basically, uh, there's like a, you know, email newsletter thing you can sign up for. Um, I will say if you hate getting spam mail, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it because I literally have yet to send out a single email uh, to my email list because I'm terrible at that. But I know that eventually when I do get a project up, um, you know, if you want to be, I, I definitely will send out emails and stuff notifying of when I'm going to be in certain states and areas and performing there. So uh, you know, if you're in the continental U.S. somewhere, um, by all means, please sign up and, and hopefully I'll make it out to your neck of the woods and we can actually meet uh, in the flesh. But I just put a link in the chat. That's, uh, that's my website and a place where you can put in your email to, to stay in touch. Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, it's been, it's been such a pleasure. Uh -huh. What was that? Does anybody have any feedback? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Lucy. <laughs> I uh, I have. If the time allows, I would have uh, one question and uh, uh, one um, um, final thought about the. Uh, yeah. yeah. We can uh, <laughs> we can close with uh, your question, Lucy. Thank you. Yes. First of all, I appreciate your uh, thought provoking speech, and uh, your magic, of course, is very fantastic, and. Uh, Actually, my question is: In your career, you have three, you play three roles: magician, mind reader, and uh, storyteller. And I would assume it's a mysterious storyteller. And uh, and please tell us how you get to these three 
avenues and uh, are they are there common grounds of them hmm. and do you yeah. still yeah. have a, any preference thank you yeah absolutely thanks for your question lucy so hmm. one clarification i'll make in terms of categorization is again and this is really important to me for reasons i've talked about before but magician and mind reader to me are the same thing mind reading is simply under the umbrella category of magician like there again at least for me and at least for everything that I've encountered, there's no special power or ability. They're, they are, for lack of a better word, they're tricks, right? They have methods that exist in reality. And so it's all, all of it is creating the illusion of something impossible, right? Um, and so, but I do consider myself uh, equal parts kind of magician and storyteller um, in that I think it's also important, at least in what I'm exploring, um, I want to use magic as a tool to take myself and others on a journey um, and to explore certain ideas and questions and emotions and that kind of thing. Because at a certain point, you know, something about magic that's wonderful and kind of terrible at the same time is that magic is really inherently fascinating to many people, myself included, right? And because of how inherently fascinating it is, it's one of those things that can kind of stand on its own, right? Like you can you can go to a magic show and just see a series of tricks and be and feel satisfied, right? And I certainly will enjoy watching just straight magic probably for the rest of my life. But I've for me, I've been in it long enough that just purely the impossible is no longer enough, right? For me, just a, a trick ends starts to be starts to be a little meaningless. Like it, it starts to be like trying to just eat candy, right? Like I can eat a ton of candy and maybe I'll like it, but I'll never really feel full, right? And for me to feel full, the tricks have to speak to something greater than just here. Look at what I can do. Look at this impossible thing, right? Look at this other thing, right? But more of what does this mean about how we exist and view the world and how we interact with each other and, and you know, the journeys that we go on in life and all that ex existential stuff. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. For the, for the magic to feed and, and, and kind of the big goal, especially like with the last project with road signs and with the work I'm interested in doing now, it's like, how do we create a quote unquote magic show or a play with magic where the magic and the narrative and the journey that we go on are so intertwined that they can't exist without the other, right? Where the magic, propels the narrative forward and the journey forward and the journey naturally leads into moments of magic right and that's kind of um that's kind of what's on my mind and where I, where i'm trying to go uh as i as i move along and, and create new work oh well said i like that yeah so actually uh john i remember one commenter said uh john knows how to use magic to weave into others hearts and minds and i think one piece was missing there and can anyone here guess? <laughs> the mysterious act uh, could get my goosebumps running. So I would rather say you lighten up your audience, heart, mind, and body. Mm. Thank you so very much, John. Very yeah, Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Lucy. <laughs> and again, thank you, Shiny, for having me uh, and inviting <laughs> me and Shane and Ava. And, and thank you all for being here. I really, uh, I really uh, appreciate your time. Uh, John, before before you leave the meeting, uh, there there are some comments in the chat box. I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, you would love to hear them. Yeah, uh, Irene Irene Fang wrote great presentation. Enjoy a lot. Charlene wrote thank you very much, John. And the the last one, I love it. Uh, I love it very much. Elaine um, wrote down, John, great job. Your parents must be very proud of you. So go out and call your parents, tell them about this. <laughs> oh, they're here right now. <laughs> yeah. Those are the comments left. <laughs> yeah, I really admire their parents. So, John, I do think you ought to introduce your parents. Well, uh, there's Ray <laughs> and Stuf and Ty. Their background is a snowy tree. Uh, they're in New Jersey. So, Hello, yeah. everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's John's show, not ours. No, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Well, he wouldn't be here tonight without y'all. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. I, I hope you all have a good evening show. or morning and day. Yeah. Yeah, I will let Shen uh, close the show space. And thank yeah. you all for promoting Lucy, Eva, and all of you coming. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Shani. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, Bong Bong. <laughs> yeah. Shani, it is always an excitement and thrill to work with you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Shin. That's a big, big, I have a big nervous. <laughs> oh, no. Shani is it. so much I fun. And, and she entertains us. Like the energy that she brings into a room is something that I really, really miss, right? And so um, that's, the, that's the thing about being in person that I really <clears> miss. And the fact that our birthdays are just one day apart, like we're both Gemini and, and that sort of thing. And so that's a high energy kind of thing too, if you follow that and stuff like that. So there's just a lot of excitement and that she just works so hard to put these things together and provides it to people all over the world. And I, just keep saying that how many that's all I need to say. say it. Mm -hmm. I've shared the stage. Yeah, I've shared the stage with you, and you've performed in Texas and told us stories in Texas about Taiwan and your um your cultural stories and your creation stories and your kind of uh, Jack stories, you know, about the trickster and all of those things that bring us all together and bring us closer. So she's kind of a diplomat by coming to meet us in the U.S. and then she brings us here all together. So it's just fabulous. And John, are you still on? I hope, I don't know if he is. I thought he's, I missed it. Yeah, I had a show again because the Facebook they missed the they want to bring to camera. I'm, I still need to practice it. First. See, oh, see your 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 magic trick was so fabulous. Like you, your sense of humor is off the charts. I love you so much, Shani. It's just so <laughs> much fun, and just bringing John to us. And I'm going to talk about John, even though he's not here. His parents still are. And what an amazing thing it is to have somebody like follow your dreams, because too often we get stuck in a rut that you're supposed to start kindergarten and go through grade school and then junior high and high school and college and and then graduate school and then get your Ph.D. or get some kind of law degree or some other kind of degree. And it never gives us room to be who we are. And there's one of the big dangers that I want to say about that is because there was a famous man and I can't I can't remember his name, but he was a doctor. His parents had forced him to become a doctor and he was a doctor and he was really wanting to be a comedian. And and there's like that success story that he took that risk and became a comedian and got on t uh, the movies and it was in the huge movie um the bachelor night the um where they lose their their groom i can't think of it but all you know there was the pretty boys were in it it was hilarious you know that kind of thing and this guy made his movie debut and became an overnight sensation but you know what i always felt sorry for all the patients who had to have a comedian for a doctor. And we've got to get people into their true callings. And one of the things I was going to say, and I was, I'll send this to John, but um, I wanted to say that science always follows experience. And logic always follows mystery. Odd. And proof always follow curiosity. So what you may not think is really happening or really true. You may think that, that the sun revolves around the earth instead of the earth revolving around the sun. You may think that only intelligent man exists today and that everyone that came before us was less than. It's not true. 
there's science every day is catching up with the unimaginable with the with the magic with the the wonder that is in the world that we live in wow. and we are all storytellers <laughs> and we all have stories to tell whether they're cultural stories or mythology stories or religious stories or science stories or personal stories or family stories that I want us all to open up and share. So if you're by yourself, oh, cool. I think you should find a storytelling group. Find somebody to tell your story to because you have a wealth of knowledge that this next generation needs to <laughs> hold on. So I love to tell stories. And open up next possibility. Absolutely. <laughs> Lucky. You can lead to someone around the world. Uh -huh. Lucky, you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Do you want to say something today? Thank you for coming. No, it, it was, oh, thank you for inviting. It was a pleasure. <laughs> I was comparing notes with all the magicians that I met in my uh, uh, 80 years of life. I met quite a number of magicians, and I thought uh, our friend did wonderfully well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a future story. Uh, so everybody okay? So I'm gonna close okay. our live stream. Okay. And then stop. Thank you very time. much, Shani. Uh, stop recording.